27. It's called The Healing of the Dream. Original edition, it's called The Body and the Dream. And in the CE edition, it's called Healing the Ancient Dream. Begins in section one, which is the picture of crucifixion, which was the introduction in the original edition. The wish to be unfairly treated is a compromise attempt that would combine attack and innocence. Who can combine the wholly incompatible and make a unity of what can never join? So basically that's what the mind has done is to bring truth and illusion into the mind without distinction. And it just carries on. There's always the contradictory thought. And in this opportunity to try to be a victim or wish to be unfairly treated, it's a compromise that compromises between attack and innocence. In order to be a victim, you have to believe in attack. And to justify attack, you always present the face of innocence. So you are going to be the innocent party in this situation and therefore justified in your retaliatory position you take. When the goal here is attack, that's what the ego's about. It's about attack. That's how it defines the body in and of itself. Walk you the gentle way, and you will fear no evil and no shadows in the night, but place no terror symbols on your path, for you will weave a crown of thorns from which your brother and yourself will not escape. So, who weaves the crown of thorns? You do. How? by placing terror symbols in your dream. What are symbols? Symbols come as a part, an expression of an image. We're image makers, so we make images that are seen as in symbol form, which come from that which is within the mind of content and form that is in the mind, and now it is projected out into a separation and into these symbols. And since that whole operation is done in a thought of fear, they have to be terror symbols. Symbols are convenient ways to testify back to the projecting mind, its concept and view regarding whatever the dream you're dreaming at that time. You can be, if you're motivated by fear and guilt and judgment and attack, it says you weave this thing. In other words, this is an ongoing process that you're weaving a crown, thorns. When you get through with the crown, you already built this thing up to where you're justified in the crucifixion or the attack. Into the victim of that. And therefore justified in your defense of your innocence, your false innocence, your face of innocence. And this word weaving has been used a couple of different times in the course. And that's what we're basically trying to do. We're trying to weave truth in with illusion. And you cannot do it. You cannot crucify yourself alone. And if you are unfairly treated, he must suffer the unfairness that you see. In other words, your brother. You cannot sacrifice yourself alone, for sacrifice is total. If it could occur at all, it would entail the whole of God's creation and the Father with the sacrifice of His beloved Son. So these thoughts are total. These concepts are total. To pretend to believe that they are not total is absolute insanity. Well, the way we can personalize and internalize and privatize our world and our thinking and our concepts of what's right and what's wrong and what's just and what's unjust gives us sets us up as the ruler of our world and the judge and the executioner of those who make up our world but you have to realize those that make up your world are there for a purpose and that's the purpose you put them there for they're there to justify you in the belief of you and your world your wish, your desire, your message. You send out the messengers and they report back to you through these symbols. In your release from sacrifice is his made manifest and shown to be his own. But every pain you suffer do you see as proof that he is guilty of attack. Thus would you make yourself to be the sign that he has lost his innocence and need but look on you to realize that he has been condemned. See, there's that reflection back. We do this to ourselves. We know that. So what we've done is we've taken mind, which is one, 
And as you said, we've segregated and fenced off an idea that I can get away with any thought, any concept that I want to have and not affect all. Your thoughts have an effect on all because, as you said, it's your world. So you're going to affect everything in your world, which is your thought, which is your mind. And so these thoughts of sacrifice, that I've put forth the face of innocence, I've been attacked, I am now unfairly treated, and so how did I get unfairly treated? I'm the face of innocence. So therefore, someone must have attacked me, therefore it's you. If I want to project my guilt on you as being my attacker, what is the sign for you to see so that you will feel condemned? You look at me. So I'll choose sickness and death, and then I will look back, and the Course says, in our insanity, we look back and say, okay, look what you did to me. This is your fault. You did this. Not saying that out loud, but that's the thought. That is the constant witness. That's why there's so much guilt associated with sickness and hospitals and hospice and death and funerals. That's why the family goes crazy and everybody's fighting one another when it happens. Because this thing is loaded with guilt. Look at me. You did this. I'm the suffering saint here. I'm the saint. I'm innocent. And what to you has been unfair will come to him in righteousness. The unjust vengeance that you suffer now belongs to him. And when it rests on him, are you set free. So this is the madness of thinking that you can project this guilt and this condemnation out on your brother. Wish not to make yourself a living symbol of his guilt, for you will not escape the death you made for him, but in his innocence you find your own. See, if I go back to the fundamental principle here that we keep going back to is the ideas leave not their source. See, we made up a system to where we believe that we are the idea that we made, and that everything that we don't want, we can get rid of, by placing it on another symbol that we see outside of ourselves, cleansing ourselves by making them guilty. But because of the law of the mind, you can't do that because the guilt never leaves the source that's trying to project it to get rid of it. So what you're doing is you're making both you and your brother guilty. Guiltier, because projection is a distortion of extension which always comes with an increase right. because that extension is creation and the ego knows that the ego thought is happy that you're increasing the guilt but he's has to measure it out so that you will allow for this to continue in your madness without dealing with the level of fear that comes along with it we're in paragraph three now this is section two picture of crucifixion starts in the original edition here Whenever you consent to suffer pain, to be deprived, unfairly treated, or in need of anything, you but accuse your brother of attack upon God's Son. Now think about that. If you think you need something, you're accusing your brother of an attack. In other words, why am I missing this? Why am I lacking this? Somebody must have stole this from me. It's got to be it's somebody Somebody's else. fault. Somebody's right. got it. Somebody's got it. And we're going to keep looking for it. Jesus says, keep looking for it until you realize it must be within their body. It must be within their idea. So I'm going to get in that body, and I'm going to kill it. I'm going to kill that body. That's why some of these murders are so, and we think, oh, my God, what was wrong? They tore them up, and they cut into them, and everything. They're looking for something, but they don't know what they're looking for. They just know there's been something stolen, and they're hiding it. And they, the only place that they could really hide it, because I've searched everywhere else, is within the body. Well, and also this belief of degrees... See, there's degrees of suffering, so it's got to be degrees of death. What does the ego say? The ego says, not only am I going to kill you, I'm going to send you to hell. I'm sending you to oblivion <laughs> because there are degrees and we can't extend it far enough to satisfy the unquenchable hate of this thought. You hold a picture of your crucifixion before his eyes that he may see his sins are written in heaven in your blood and death and go before him closing off the gate and damning him to hell. Yet this is written in hell and not in heaven, where you are beyond attack and prove his innocence. The picture of yourself you offer him, you show yourself and give it all your faith. The Holy Spirit offers you to give to him a picture of yourself in which there is no pain and no reproach at all, 
And what was martyred to his guilt becomes the perfect witness to his innocence. We become the saviors of our symbols that we made to testify to our guilt. When we realize, when we wake up, we become the innocent to those who see themselves guilty and need a savior. Where instead of agreeing with their guilt and holding them in the prison of guilt, we set them free. We declare their innocence together because innocence is oneness. And this is why this is a course of miracles. The power of witness is beyond belief because it brings conviction in its wake. The witness is believed because he points beyond himself to what he represents. I remember years ago, you'll remember the pastor that started teaching, I think it's in Isaiah, a sign shall be given, a virgin will conceive. And what he taught was Jesus was a sign. In other words, he's not the reality. He's the sign. Sign means it's a signification. It's a symbol. It's not the reality. He's the sign. And that's what this is talking about is the witness is believed because he points beyond to what he represents. We utilize the body as a means of communication to declare the real world. We're witnessing to that which is beyond our words and our expression to the real world. To that which is true within you, the Holy Spirit that is within your mind where the reality is. So now that same thing is done through the operation that he just talked about, which is what are you going to witness to? If I'm witnessing to I'm a victim here and I'm dying and I'm sick and it's your fault and I'm expressing that you're guilty, I'm guilty, the whole thing needs to go to hell and believe me. A sick and suffering you, but represent your brother's guilt, the witness that you send, lest he forget the injuries he gave, from which you swear he never will escape. The sick and sorry picture you accept, if only it can serve to punish him. The sick are merciless to everyone, and in contagion do they seek to kill. Death seems an easy price if they can say, Behold me, brother, at your hand I die. It's watching some things about the singer Freddie Mercury, who was the front man for Queen, who appeared to pass away from AIDS. Now, during that AIDS crisis, a lot of people continued to knowingly pass on that disease for their own purposes. You wonder, how can that be done? Well, it's right there. There is no love in this thing. So don't tell me about we were making love in that situation. It's a thought of murder and hate. The excitement comes in the murder and hate. And so it's not to make Freddie Mercury different than anyone else that's in this dream. We're all doing this if we are witnessing to this victimized, poor old me. I'm the victim. You're the attacker. And you're guilty for what you've done. Death seems an easy price if they say, Behold me, brother, at your hand I die. For sickness is the witness to his guilt, and death would prove his errors must be sins. Sickness is but a little death, quote little death, a form of vengeance not yet total. Yet it speaks with certainty for what it represents. The bleak and bitter picture you have sent your brother you have looked upon in grief, and everything that it has shown to him have you believed, because it witnessed to the guilt in him which you perceived and loved. Can you imagine we love the guilt that we project onto our brothers? So sickness is a little death, but death itself is the final proof that this is not a mistake. This is sin. This is immutable. This calls for punishment, not correction. A lot of suicides going on. There's a very prominent woman in the news now that committed suicide. There's so much that goes on in that. There's so much underneath in that unconscious realm of the mind that is showing up in this activity we call suicide. Now, if we take this back to its source, which you have to take back, let's go past the two symbols of the brothers, and let's go back to the Father and the Son, because this had to have its beginning in a concept, in an aspect of mind that says, I'm the victim, because you won't make me special. You're the victimizer. You have attacked me by not giving me my specialness. So this all begins in this thought. So an attack on the symbols that you make within your world and within your dream is merely a playing out of your trying to kill the son, trying to attack the father. That's all it is. It's a play out of that very thought. That's what he's talking about. This is the picture of crucifixion. 
And that is the crucifixion that we can make of the Son something that he is not, which would be this idea of crucifixion. Now in the hands, made gentle by his touch, the Holy Spirit lays a picture of a different you. It is a picture of a body still, for what you really are cannot be seen nor pictured. Yet this one has not been used for purpose of attack and therefore never suffered pain at all. So here comes the transition to a new function and a new purpose for the body. This body is a picture, an expression of a different you. In other words, a holy you or a whole you. And now is a symbol that is not used for attack. And if it's not used for attack, the guiltless mind can't suffer, so it cannot suffer pain at all. It witnesses to the eternal truth that you cannot be hurt and points beyond itself to both your innocence and his. Show this unto your brother, who will see that every scar is healed and every tear is wiped away in laughter and in love. And he will look on his forgiveness there and with healed eyes will look beyond it to the innocence that he beholds in you. Here is the proof that he has never sinned, that nothing which his madness bid him do was ever done or ever had effects of any kind, that no reproach he laid upon his heart was ever justified and no attack can ever touch him with the poisoned and relentless sting of fear. So now, the simple symbol of the corrected thought of the body as a means of communicating this holiness is having this effect because they're looking for witnesses. You now are a witness of light and not a witness of darkness. You are a witness of holiness, not a witness of sin. You're a witness of life, not a witness of death. And it's interesting there, it says the scar is healed. You think about a scar. A scar is a permanent mark of an event that took place some time in the past. The idea that there was sin and that it's permanent, the scar is there, that we're stuck with this. Hey, buddy, how'd you get that scar? Oh, well, I was in the military 35 years ago. This this, this happened. Uh, well, son, where'd you get that scar? Oh, I sinned. And I can't get rid of the scar. The scar constantly reminds me that I'm a sinner. This right here says the scar is gone. The scar disappears in this new set. How does that happen? By changing your concept from a victim and a victimizer to recognizing there are no victims and there are no victimizers and there never was any sin. It's interesting that in the studies they do on reincarnation that many times, I'm trying to think of the term they use, they don't use scar, but many times a a birthmark. birthmark or whatever will show up and many times in the research that is done in the memory, the birthmark appears to be a remnant of the thought of some sort of victimization in the past, usually some type of violence or violent crime. So it kind of goes right along with the idea of the past showing up, but being healed. Attest his innocence and not his guilt. Your healing is his comfort and his health because it proves illusions are not true. It is not will for life, but wish for death that is the motivation for this world. Its only purpose is to prove guilt real. No worldly thought or act or feeling has a motivation other than this one. We talked about the content. We talked about the cause. It's a spurious cause, but it's what? To wish for death to prove that guilt is real. In all of our thoughts and actions and how we feel, all these things we think we're doing is all based and rooted in this thought of guilt and to prove it. These are the witnesses that are called for to be believed and lend conviction to the system they speak for and represent. And each has many voices speaking to your brother and yourself in different tongues. And yet to both, the message is the same. An interesting question came up in the course group the other night, and I had rethought something. I know that Jesus did not suffer on the cross, but those that wanted to see him suffer on the cross saw him suffer on the cross. I believe those who wanted to see reality to see the expression of the communication of the body and the lesson for what Jesus was doing saw him probably smiling 
and showing symbols of love. This is how I believe that the centurion looked up and said, truly this was the Son of God, because he knew what a victim and victimization and suffering looks like, and this is not that. So there's something else going on. He must be this witness. His mind was witnessed, the centurion's mind was witnessed to by his wish to see the truth of what was being expressed there. So as far as the witnesses, you can't trust witnesses in this world because what did he just say? It's all based on trying to make guilty. And in order to prove there's guilt, I've got to see sickness and death. So people see what they want to see based on that. So it doesn't matter what is being seen because you can't focus on the illusion. You have to focus on the reality, the truth. You see, Jesus said, you don't take this course of miracles and go prove it by doing stuff out here in this realm of form. The lady's in the wheelchair and I go raise the lady up. If the Holy Spirit says go do that, the Holy Spirit's got a plan. And it has to do with the lady. But if I do it to try to prove something, that doesn't prove anything because the symbols are made to be interpreted this way. It's guilt. One of the interesting things our friend had posted the other day on Facebook that when she was a young girl, she was in church and she was looking at what you normally see depicted in most Catholic churches especially, which is the suffering Jesus on the cross with the blood spilling from the hands and the feet and the crown of thorns and everything. And she's looking at this suffering picture and she said the statue transformed. Jesus smiled at her and winked at her as a little girl. And she knew from that point on that there's something wrong here. This is picturing something that is not accurate. I thought that was really interesting, very interesting story. Adornment of the body seeks to show how lovely are the witnesses for guilt. So now we're talking about we have a body in this natural world that is an expression of guilt, sin, and death, and fear. But we got to dress this thing up. we got to dress this witness up. So we adorn the body. Concerns about the body demonstrate how frail and vulnerable is your life, how easily destroyed is what you love. Depression speaks of death and vanity of real concern with anything at all. The strongest witness to futility that bolsters all the rest and helps them paint the picture in which sin is justified is sickness in whatever form it takes. The sick have reason for each one of their unnatural desires and strange needs. For who could live a life so soon cut short and not esteem the worth of passing joys? What pleasures could there be that will endure? Are not the frail entitled to believe that every stolen scrap of pleasure is their righteous payment for their little lives? Their death will pay the price for all of them if they enjoy their benefits or not. The end of life must come whatever way that life be spent and so take pleasure in the quickly passing and ephemeral. Eat, drink, be merry, because tomorrow we die. Yep. <laughs> that is it. That's the story. <laughs> and uh, somebody else will pay for it later on. <laughs> See? Death, will, death will pay the bill. If you don't eat and drink, you still die in the bar, so you might as well eat and drink. Right. And be merry. Oh, you God. Don't right? think that, that every mind doesn't know about that time clock's ticking. It doesn't start ticking at age 40. It's been ticking since you were in the womb and showed up in this crazy idea. These are not sins, but witnesses unto the strange belief that sin and death are real and innocence and sin will end alike within the termination of the grave. If this were true, there would be reason to remain content to seek for passing joys and cherish little pleasures where you can. Yet in this picture is the body not perceived as neutral, and without a goal inherent in itself, for it becomes the symbol of reproach, the sign of guilt whose consequences still are there to see, so that the cause can never be denied. So, Jesus even talked about it in the Course. What is for sure? Death and taxes. And he talks about not income taxes. We're talking about this is a taxing system. It will wear you out. This thing's headed for the grave. You're headed for getting eaten by worms, and then the worms are going to die. Now, in that thought, you better cherish the little pleasures you can find. And this body then becomes a symbol of reproach. That's why the body is feared and hated, is because it is the hero of the dream, and the dream is built with fear, and it is a dream of death. The body is the symbol of death. So it's hated. Your function, 
is to show your brother sin can have no cause. How futile must it be to see yourself a picture of the proof that what your function is can never be. The Holy Spirit's picture changes not the body into something it is not. It only takes away from it all signs of accusation and of blamefulness. So again, just like all reality is, we have to remove the barriers to it. The answer is always there because it was done immediately. So all we have to do is remove the barriers of the blocks and the interference with that reality. When it comes to the body, we have to release the ideas that we have given the body. And when we're done with that, when we release those, the true interpretation by the Holy Spirit, which has always been there for the body, is there, which is it becomes a communication device of love and life. Pictured without a purpose, it is seen as neither sick nor well, nor bad nor good. No grounds are offered that it may be judged in any way at all. It has no life, but neither is it dead. It stands apart from all experience of love or fear. For now it witnesses to nothing yet, its purpose being open, and the mind made free again to choose what it is for. Now is it not condemned, but waiting for a purpose to be given, that it may fulfill the function that it will receive. See, we have to eventually reach this point of realizing without any guilt, yes, we made the body. And we made the body to testify for what the body has testified for, which is sin and guilt and judgment, attack. We've used it to signify. But now that's come to a close, that's come to an end, and there's a reinterpreting of everything. And the Holy Spirit stands ready to take everything that I made to testify to separation and reinterpret it and give it a function to testify to my reality of wholeness for the sake of the rest of the mind that still sees itself separate and apart. And that's a great thing. So without guilt, you embrace the body for its new function. It's not the end. It has become a means to an end. Under the ego, it is the end. Under the Holy Spirit's direction and guidance, it is a means to an end. That end being total return through healed and corrected perception back to knowledge. This paragraph brings us back to our words that we've been studying that starts with desire, moves to purpose and function. He just mentioned purpose and function of the body. So first thing that has to happen is you gave the body a purpose and a function. That was to witness to guilt and to death. You have to remove your purpose and function and return to the understanding that the body is neutral. It is nothing in and of itself. It is only, as you said, a means. It's not an end in and of itself. It's a neutral means. Now, if you'll accept that, now you have the opportunity to receive a new purpose and function for this same idea. Because every concept, everything we made must be corrected by the Holy Spirit and has been. All right, so now we've made the body neutral. So he says this. Into this empty space from which the goal of sin has been removed is heaven free to be remembered. Here its peace can come and perfect healing take the place of death. The body can become a sign or a symbol of life, a promise of redemption, and a breath of immortality to those grown sick of breathing in the fetid scent of death. Let it have healing as its purpose. Then will it send forth the message it received and by its health and loveliness proclaim the truth and value that it represents. Let it receive the power to represent. What does represent? To witness to. Same thing we've been talking about. To represent an endless life forever unattacked. And to your brother, let its message be, Behold me, brother, at your hand I live. See, before the message was, Behold me, brother, at your hand I get sick and die. Your fault, at your hand. Now, this can be a little contentious, I guess, but we're talking about this crucifixion idea. The question comes up in the Course community, was there a physical resurrection? Well, let's not answer that today, but let's step into it by just recovering what he just said, which was, if Jesus woke up and what Jesus did, then he must have made the body neutral in his thinking, and he must have accepted the new purpose and function as a witness and a representative of life for the body. That body cannot get sick. That body cannot die. There is no way 
that they could kill Jesus. All right. So whatever he was doing there, he was doing it as a representation or as another witness to this lesson. So the transition has already happened regarding the body. It is a representation, a witness to something. It has nothing to do with a body coming out of a tomb. That doesn't witness to anything. This witnesses to it. He was witnessing to the correct idea of a body before the crucifixion, before he laid down and utilized and folded up that body because he was done with its utilization. And then in the special messages, he clearly tells us and told Helen that the body just became what it always because There was nothing left that could be buried because it became what it always was, which was a neutral nothing in nothingness. See, there's another place later on in the course that says, and it's dealing with a mind that has entered into this we just read. And it says that it's like a well-worn coat that has served its purpose. The Holy Spirit's been able to use this form to express wholeness rather than sickness or death or fragmentation. And it says, when the time comes, it don't say you die. There's no death. It says you take this coat and you take it off and you fold it nicely and you lay it aside because it has served its purpose and you're done with it. That is the next step out of the need or the idea of needing a body. You don't need perception anymore. You don't need symbols anymore. You don't need form anymore. Because why? It's been healed. It's been corrected. And it's been used in its correction to bring further correction to the rest of the mind. And then the thoughts that brought about that situation, that witness, are left behind in the mind to continue their work of salvation. Right. Nothing is lost. A simple way to let this be achieved is merely this, to let the body have no purpose from the past when you were sure you knew its purpose was to foster guilt. For this insists your crippled picture is a lasting sign of what it represents. This leaves no space in which a different view, another purpose, can be given it. You do not know its purpose. You but gave illusions of a purpose to a thing you made to hide your function from yourself. This thing without a purpose cannot hide the function that the Holy Spirit gave. Let then its purpose and your function both be reconciled at last and seen as one. Well. So again, purpose and function. We have a special function. That special function that you have is the reinterpretation of the function you made for your body to be the expression of sin and death and loss and everything else. You had a plan. Think about it. Elvis Presley, one of my favorite symbols. He shows up. He's good looking. He can sing. He comes right at the right time for this purpose that he made. He wanted to be the savior. As a kid, he's looking at the comic books and he's Captain Marvel or whoever it was, the guy with the cape. So he's got this flashy outfits with the capes and everything. He's playing out this whole thing. What do people think about when they think about Elvis? Oh, they think about fat Elvis dying by himself, falling off the toilet. Why? Because that was the purpose, is to show the guilt. And everybody's been pointing fingers for 40 years. Who was responsible? She didn't, she should have went, he should have gone. Why didn't they give him the drugs? All this stuff. It's the perfect picture of what that was for. Now, he had a special function. He was seeking that, but he was caught in this weaving that we talked about before, and he couldn't get out of the weaving. If you remember early in the text, it talks about that we weave this like spider web of iron. And it locks us in. And he got locked in. And what did he do? He ran to death. He didn't have any option but to run to death. Now, let's take another look at specialness. The ego's concept of specialness is difference. The Holy Spirit's reinterpretation of specialness is function. That's the difference right there. Every son is special in each son's function. And they all have the same purpose. And they all have the same purpose. But with the ego, specialness was difference. So that that sets up separation, levels, judgment, guilt, attack, and on and on and on the insanity goes. 